I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. Welcome to the Black Excellence and Abundance Channel. Movies, television shows, books, magazines are filled with heroes from the Old West. However, African American women are virtually never mentioned. Historians have also contributed to this unjust and unbalanced recording of the Western saga by completely ignoring the many accomplishments of black women. Despite the fact that that they are accurately reported in newspapers, government records, military reports, and pioneer memoirs. As members of a double minority, black women have suffered an even greater historical injustice, although they were an integral part of the Western fabric. Nothing more clearly demonstrates the contribution of black women to the Western tradition than the biographies of Biddy Bridget Mason, Clara Brown, Mary Ellen Pleasant, and others. Today, we take a look at some of these pioneer great women who never quite get the credit that they deserve. Elizabeth Thorne Scott Flood was born free in 1828 in New York State, and she was educated in Massachusetts. She married Joseph Scott in 1852, and they moved to Northern California later that year. After Joseph died, Elizabeth and their son Oliver moved to Sacramento. At the time, Sacramento was a sizable African-American community, but because all non-white children were barred from public school, they were unable to receive an education. After her son was denied enrollment, Elizabeth used her own home to open a school for black children in 1854. Initially, Elizabeth's school was only open to African American children, but shortly after it opened, she started accepting Asian American and Native American students as well. The Sacramento School Board assumed control over the school in 1855, although they refused to commit public tax revenue to it. What a surprise! Elizabeth continued to teach and became the first African-American public school instructor in California. She retired from teaching after she married Isaac Flood and moved to Oakland. However, seeing the lack of educational opportunities in Oakland for non-whites, Elizabeth once again opened a school in her home. Meanwhile, she and her husband founded the Shiloh Amy Church in the town. Oakland's first black church. The church led the way to the purchase of a schoolhouse where she taught until her unexpected death in 1867 at the age of 39. Her successful activism led to school integration in Oakland and Elizabeth's daughter, Lydia, was one of the first students at the newly integrated schools. Bridget Biddy Mason was born into captivity in 1818, but her exact birthplace is unknown. Like so many other enslaved people, she was forcibly taken from her family and sold several times. Her final enslaver moved to California. Now, California was a free state, so the moment that Biddy entered California, she was technically free. However, her enslaver kept this information from her for five years. Once she learned this information, she petitioned the court for her freedom and for that of her children. Despite the obstacles that were set in place and the fact that she was not allowed to testify, she won her family's freedom and adopted the surname Mason. Mason settled in Los Angeles and worked as a nurse and a midwife. 
After saving money for a decade, she invested in real estate, becoming one of the first black female landholders in California. In spite of the obstacles in her way, nothing stopped her from achieving greatness. Her wise investments made her a fortune and a prominent citizen of the city, which she used to establish multiple charities, schools, daycares, and the first African-American church in Los Angeles. Clara Brown was a former enslaved woman born on January 1st, 1800, near Independence, Missouri. She became a community leader, philanthropist, and aided in the settlement of the former slaves during the time of Colorado's gold rush. She was known as the Angel of the Rockies and made her mark as Colorado's first black settler and a prosperous entrepreneur. At the age of three, Clara and her mother were sold and moved to Kentucky. She married at the age of 18 and had four children. In 1835, Clara's family was broken apart when they were all sold to different enslavers. Clara was sold to a plantation in Kentucky. At the age of 35, Clara's enslaver died and her husband's son and daughter were sold at auction to different enslavers. Could you imagine, folks, the atrocity of being sold like a piece of property and your family just separated? What a tragedy. After an additional 20 years in captivity, she was able to buy her freedom and immediately headed to St. Louis. At the age of 55, she agreed to serve as a cook, laundress, and exchange for free transportation to a caravan headed for the gold mines in Colorado. After all she had been through, Miss Brown still found it in her heart and dedicated her life to the betterment of others, no matter what the race, creed, or color of the person was. I have to say, she's way better than I would have been. But anyway, this great woman of God had great humility, and even after her enslavement, she did not have a prejudiced bone in her body. Miss Brown settled in the mining town of Central City, Colorado, where she established a laundromat and became very successful. As her resources expanded, she opened up her home, which served as a hospital, church, and hotel to the town's less fortunate. With the money she made, she invested in properties and mines in nearby towns. Known as Aunt Clara for her emotional and financial support, Brown was a founding member of a Sunday school made her home available for prayer services, and generously supported the community. At the end of the Civil War, Brown could freely travel and liquidated all her investments to travel to Kentucky in order to find her daughter. Although at first she was unsuccessful, she did manage to pay the way for 34 or more of her relatives and others who were formerly enslaved to move to Colorado. Finally, in 1882, she did reunite with her daughter and her granddaughter. Mary Ellen Pleasant was a millionaire and an abolitionist. Very little is known about Pleasant's young life and parents, but she was raised in Nantucket and worked as a domestic for an abolitionist family. She was very light-skinned and on some occasions passed as white. Mary Ellen became involved in the abolitionist movement and worked with the Underground Railroad. She married another abolitionist, James Smith, and gained a substantial inheritance after he died four years later. In 1849, she remarried and moved to San Francisco. Pleasant started a restaurant that catered to wealthy businessmen in the city, and she would often eavesdrop on these men to pick up investment tips and financial gossip. These bits of information came in handy as Pleasant was able to use them to make a fortune in investments. She used her money and influence to assist African Americans who made it to San Francisco through the Underground Railroad, and later she successfully fought against racial segregation in California through a series of lawsuits. 
She also gave militant abolitionist John Brown $30,000 to support his raid on Harper's Ferry in 1859. In 1901, she dictated her autobiography, and when she passed in 1904, she was one of California's most famous residents. Another great black pioneer and personality of importance was Miss Cathay Williams. She was born in Missouri in 1842. Her father was a free man, but her mother was enslaved which meant that Kathy herself was born into captivity. She was captured by Union forces in the Civil War, but as with many captured enslaved people, she was pressed into servitude in the Union Army. After the war ended, Kathy Williams found herself a free woman. She wanted to enlist in the Army, but they didn't accept women. Williams didn't let that stop her. She just changed her name to William Cathay, posed as a man, and served with the Buffalo Soldiers for two years. After her secret was revealed, she was discharged from the Army. She moved to Pueblo, Colorado and married a man who would eventually steal all her money and run away with her horses. Williams had him arrested, moved to Trinidad, Colorado, and took up work as a self-employed seamstress. Miss Abby Fisher, born enslaved in 1831 South Carolina, she grew up and eventually worked as a cook in a kitchen. She married Alexander Fisher around 1859 and together they had 11 children. The family moved to San Francisco, California in 1877 looking for economic opportunity. There, she opened her own immensely successful catering business called Mrs. Abby Fisher and Company and won awards for her cooking. Abby's Southern cooking was the toast of San Francisco society, and she became only the second African-American female cookbook author in America in 1881 when she published What Mrs. Fisher Knows About All Southern Cooking, Soups, Pickles, Preserves. Her cookbook had 160 recipes. The book is a treasure trove of Southern cooking for historians, and it was reprinted in 1995. Her book can still be purchased on Amazon Kindle today. It was the great black women cooks of America that inspired the fictional character, Aunt Chamama. The brand is still wildly successful to this day. These unheralded, unsung, and unappreciated black women of the Old West help establish the country that we know today. They were teachers, nurses, businesswomen, builders of churches, landowners, cooks, nannies, mothers, wives, and daughters. They were indeed then, as they are now, the backbone of this country and the world. The Black Excellence in Abundance Channel, where Black history is every day. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe. And as always, never forget that thou art rich.